Hi, everybody. I'm Phil Town. I'm Danielle Town. We're here to talk about... Rule what, one investing. Yeah, rule one investing. What don't lose money means. Yeah, that's really kind of what we're focusing on right now because, you know, like great investing is all about um, a really, really good high rate of return with a really low risk. And Warren Buffett puts it like this. There's two rules of investing that you have to follow. Rule number one is don't lose money. And rule number two is don't forget rule number one. And then we get the eye roll. Right. <laughs> you know? hey, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, right. funny. Yeah, we all get it. And, and, you know, buy low, sell high. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that non-advice. And, uh, and, you know, what else can you tell me? So what we need to understand is that that's not, um, it's not, you know, that, it's not trivial. It's actually really profound. Like a lot of really simple sounding things are. This is really profound. It's all about a basic style of investing that says that I've got to invest in such a way that I don't lose and I can win huge. So think about it. In a sense, what Warren Buffett is saying is when he places a bet, he's placing a risk-free bet with massive upside. Now, if you can bet with no risk, and massive upside, like you're certain to make money, you just don't know how much, then you are going to end up really, really rich. Absolutely. Yeah. The question is whether it's true that it's a risk-free bet. Okay, fair enough. So let's say that there's um, some possibility that there's no such thing as certainty in the world. Right? <laughs> are you certain that there's no such thing as certainty? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And if there is, if, if we can't be absolutely certain, then the idea that you could invest without ever losing any money, of course, is a fiction. And I think we can pretty well be assured that Warren has lost money on occasional, on something occasionally. I don't know, maybe. I don't know for sure if he has in the long run. But let's assume that you, you would maybe lose a little here and there. Still, wouldn't that be an incredible um, betting structure that... At the end of the day, if you stay in the game, you're not going to lose money. I mean, wouldn't that give confidence to a small investor that they could actually do this if they did it right, that they wouldn't lose money? Because I think if that's all you're going for, no, that doesn't give me any confidence. I don't want to have the same amount of money 30 years from now that I have right now. I didn't lose money, that's true, but I haven't gained any money either. Okay, but that's only one side of the equation, right? Right, right. The you other side is... We talked about the, the upside. Yeah. And the other side is the, the huge potential but when upside. But say, when you say don't lose money, it doesn't mention the upside. Well, then we got to put it the way... I, I think Monash Pabrai does a, a maybe an even... I don't want to say a better job because I, it's hard to say anybody does a no better one job does a better than Buffett. Job than you, Dad. Oh, me, yeah. That's what I was going to say. I was thinking Buffett, actually, when I was saying that. But... Um, but Monash comes from more like where the rest of us come from, right? Um, how does this all work? How do you unfold Warren Buffett style investing? Now, let me give you a little of his background. He's a business guy out of India. Um, he had ran a company uh, that he really hated. It wasn't him. Didn't like in doing it um, in India and in the United States. And um, he had about I don't know 270 employees or something. When he really started to dawn on him, and he was he was very successful with it. He was like a member of the Young Presidents Organization and a young successful guy. And but he didn't love what he was doing with his life. It just wasn't him, right? Running this business, and he had been following what Warren Buffett had been teaching for a long time. And he finally decided uh, that he just started investing, and he did very well. And then he started his own fund called Provide Fund, fund. And um, and then he wrote a book about the whole thing called The Dondo Investor. D-H-A-N-D-O. And it really is a wonderful book. And I think it'll really help you understand this notion. Um, if you read it, it'll help you understand this notion of, um, of focusing on rule number one, not losing money when you're going into uh, an investment. So How one, does he describe well, it? Well, he describes it as a bet. So whereas Buffett's over here basically saying, look, we, we only invest when we're certain we're going to make money. That's not really a bet. You know, that's so, but, but by putting it in the category of, of gambling, you can start to see the impact of it where you have a risk-free bet with a lot of upside. That would be an enormously wonderful thing to come on to. You know, it just doesn't happen much in the real world. So he starts to explain how this could be by describing this family from India 
called the Patel family. And this is what I love about this guy's mind. It's just wonderful that he thinks how these things can kind of go together. The Patel family came to America in the 1960s, kind of leaving the homeland with nothing. Like Papa Patel. From India. From India. Papa Patel had about two months to realize he was exiting the village. Like they were booting him out for something. Manesh talks about it in the book. Wait, is this a true story? Yeah, true story. Oh. Oh, yeah. Real deal. So the father and this family from this one little part of India comes to America with a few thousand dollars and decides that he's going to place a bet. Now, Monash is going to tell the story a lot better than I can, but I'm going to just ballpark it here real quickly, that what basically happens is he looks around at where he thinks more and more money will be placed from other investors. And he decides that, and of course, he's only got a few thousand dollars. So what would you do if you're in a country, you don't speak the language or you barely do, you've got $8,000, $9,000. How, you know, what do you do, right? What did he do? He went out and bought a a really rundown motel. Hmm. Owner carried the financing, bought this horrible motel, you can buy a motel for $8,000? Oh, yeah. They're trying to give it away. Nobody wanted it because nobody could make money on it. <laughs> it. It just didn't have enough people coming in. You know, when, you've seen them, those crap motels on the side of the road in some little town somewhere. Sure. Yeah. So those things aren't real valuable because nobody ever shows up. And so what he did is he got, you know, he's got his family and the kids and they became the maids and the electricians and the repairman and the front desk and the back office and all of it. They did all of it. And they lived on just nothing, right? They're vegetarians. They cooked in the main office of the home. They lived in the motel and they just kept the expenses absolutely limited. And they basically were risking all of the money they had in this one bet. But the way Manesh presents it is you can sort of see that if they somehow, if they lost on this bet, if they failed and they were foreclosed on and by, you know, they couldn't pay the monthly payments on the mortgage. And if they were foreclosed on, then their downside was only that they'd lost this $9,000. And that downside wasn't that horrible because if they failed, then both Papa and Mama Patel could go to work at a buck sixty an hour, doing whatever, washing dishes if they need, if they had to for somebody else. They could make enough money to save a few thousand dollars a year by living incredibly tight like they were, and then building it back up to nine thousand dollars in two or three years. Okay. So, in effect, they could take a shot at this thing, and Monash kind of goes through the odds of it. It's pretty cool where you basically go, okay, what are the odds of success? Well, you know, let's say that um, they get it wrong the first time, but they learn a lot and then they get it right the second time, whatever. Essentially, they're taking a pretty decent bet um, that is well worth taking that could result in a good upside. All right, he, he runs the numbers for you. Are you. But you follow kind of what I'm saying? Yeah, so it seems like there's a good chance of turning this motel into something because they're hardworking, they've got enough people in their family, they're living there. Their expenses are minimal. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. So, so what Manesh is pointing out is that he calls this dondo. This is this is a way of doing business, of finding something that's really really super cheap, that you have very low downside on. If you lose, you lose almost nothing, and if you win, you win big. Okay. And that's what the Patel family did. So long story short, and he tells you the whole story in chapter one. It's a phenomenal story. This Patel family succeeded with that first motel. And then they could go to the bank and borrow against the new equity of that Mm -hmm. motel Mm -hmm. to get motel number two, which they could bring a family member over from India who would live the same way they did, the same values, hardworking, really low expenses, and build the second motel up, all right? I don't know if you're ready for this, but this is the truth. It's so unbelievable. (laughs) They now own 50% of the motels in America. 50%. 
Of independent motels? Of all of them. All of them. Of all the Hiltons and the Hyatts and the all of them. Of all of those, the Patel family controls 50% of the rooms in America. Unflippin' believable. And they've done it one at a time like that. One family member, one family member, one family member. They now have, I don't know the exact number, I think Monash said it's $70 billion worth of motel equity. Billion with a B. And how many years did this take? 40. Oh my god! I know! <laughs> what? I know! How is this not a huge story? I don't know! It should, it should be a movie, it should be Hollywood, it should be <laughs> like the President of the United States should be using these guys as, a, 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 as a, uh, an optimistic scenario, tale of how you succeed in America. Let's have one of those people be President. Absolutely, let's run a Patel for president. Run Patel for president. I mean, Monash Pabrai should be president. I think. But here's the thing that, that he's pointing out is that they built this with this principles of Dondo, and that means very low risk when you go into something with a very high upside. So you want to bet where if you lose, you lose very little, and if you win, you win huge. And that is a little better explanation, I think, for what Warren Buffett means when he says, you know, rule number one is don't lose money. Essentially, Buffett is, and there is no rule number two. Essentially, Buffett's saying the same thing. When you're placing this investment, it's only an investment if the downside is very low. Like, if you lose, you don't lose much. If, the, if there's a greater downside, it would be a gamble? If it's a greater downside, it'd be a gamble. It would be an unacceptable risk for a rule one investor or a Patel. And since Monash is probably right that we should absolutely get a lesson from the Patels because of their enormous success, I think they have a million people working for them right now. Oh my gosh. They I paid would think with that many hotel rooms. Listen to this. This is my favorite thing. Is these were immigrants with nothing. And forty years later, the Patel families paid seven hundred and fifty million dollars in taxes last year. Jeez. I know. I know. God bless them. You know, we need a little more of that in America, don't you think? So I've got this friend of mine um, who worked with Zig Ziglar for a lot of years. Chris Dunham, he's an Indian guy, came over to America, um, started a speaking career and uh, consulting to Fortune 500 companies, and um, ended up on the stage with me in front of 20,000 people for years. You know, he would often be the speaker right in front of me, so I got to hear his speech all the time. And he would go in and tell people in America that you have you have won the lottery by being born an American. <laughs> <laughs> You've won the lottery. Um, you know, people all over the world wish they had the opportunities that you have in this country. And um, and I think he was basically trying to say we don't take advantage of them. Hmm. And the Patel family's a wow, what an example. You know, we live here and we didn't do that. Absolutely, you absolutely. Know. So we obviously miss a lot of opportunities that are right in front of our nose. But and I think that's why people are listening to this. That's why they buy books about investing. That's why they buy books about creating a better life and success. It's because we are trying to do those things. We just don't know how. We don't know how. And I mean, that's, that's it that's, right It sounds there. very like motivationally and self-helpy. But like truly, what do you do in the next 10 minutes to change your life? Like it's very hard to know what to do and still buy the groceries, still take care of the kids, still have some sort of a life, still exercise. Like all of those things take so much time. And it's really hard to know what to do. And for somebody who's an immigrant coming into this country, I mean, I'm not like that's an extraordinary, difficult, extraordinarily difficult situation. But you're starting from zero. You, in a way, are not hampered by all of these structures of life that we've built up around ourselves. You know, they didn't have a mortgage to pay. They could just move into that motel. I'm not saying that it was easy at all. I'm just saying I understand why it's difficult for people to make changes. Well, by that standard, then the easiest thing to do to get yourself rolling would be to move to a different city, <laughs> sell your house, take $9,000, put yourself in the position of the Patel family, and now all of a sudden you'll have the same advantages they do. Sometimes that is easier. And I mean, I've moved I, a lot of times and it is kind of sometimes nice to pick everything up and just start over. But I'm going to suggest that if you do that, you get rid of everything, you now become an immigrant person, you have the advantage of speaking the language of this country, 
you move to a new city where you don't know anyone. All you have is you and your husband or your wife and your kids, and that's it, and $9,000 that you still fail. And the reason is because the Patel family, Papa Patel and his wife, knew something what did they that know? you don't know. What did they know? They know Dondo. They were Dondo. They knew that concept of taking a very low risk with a very high upside. So they weren't afraid of losing their $9,000. That petrifies people who are relatively poor. They've got $9,000, they're terrified about losing it. So what do they do? They follow the advice of the entire American financial services industry, which is, oh my Lord, don't take any risk with that. Right. You, they would tell you, you're the least risk, you're the most risk averse client I have. You don't have enough money to take any risk. You should only put that money in a 30-year bond or a 10-year bond, or if you're younger, you can put it in the stock market and leave it there in a general indexed fund, and your 9,000 might grow at between three and 7% a year. And you're gonna be poor your whole life. True. Because that advice is crap. That advice will kill you. And you know it in your heart, you know that. And so people just, are so frustrated that that the, the advice coming from the professionals is useless to them if they don't have already have a pile of money. In fact, the professionals know that too. Merrill Lynch a while back sent out something, sent out a letter to all of their salespeople who are like financial advisors and said, stop bothering pe with people that have less than $100,000. You're wasting your time. Because what are you gonna tell them? They don't fit the risk profile that allows you to put them into alternative investments or, or, or you know, that they would do for a millionaire. And so all you're going to do is put them into an index. You don't make anything on that. Waste of time. I mean, you can see that. So, I mean, it's really, really irritates me that the people who need to take uh, a Dondo view of the world aren't ever taught how to do that. They're never taught how to do it. Exactly. So the the, the way to have that confidence that you I don't completely know about the Dondo view of the world, but in order to have the confidence to make that kind of investment and to say this investment is one with a very minimal risk and a very high upside. That takes some skill. It takes some skill. It takes knowledge and skill and probably some practice. Yeah, you have to and that's a huge difference. That's why you take John Doe and his wife and send him off to Tulsa, Oklahoma to be an immigrant. They're not going to figure this out. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, it's never going to occur to them to go buy a flea bag motel. We don't motel. learn this stuff. We, don't, we just don't. No, we don't learn this stuff. They don't teach us this stuff. And in fact, I'll tell you, I started to make a show about this with CNBC. I made a pilot with them um, a bunch of years ago after my book first came out, my first book. And they refused to put it on the air. What was that about? I don't remember. That was about, it was called The Rebel Investor. And it was a, the idea that I was really pushing on the show was you don't have a downside. You're, you only have a little bit of money. It's, this is when you take the risk, right? Yeah, yeah. But you need to take a structured risk. You need to take a risk that is calculated, that has very low downside and a very high upside. And you might be wondering, well, wait a second. If I'm taking my $9,000 and I'm putting it into a motel and I fail because I'd never been in the motel business, then isn't that a high risk? And the answer is no. You only lost $9,000. You can get it back in a couple of years of just going out and working and saving your money. You, the, the amount of real risk there is extremely low. I, I use this on the show that I did. and I, I said, look, you're not getting in a Conestoga wagon and riding across the prairie with your children, <laughs> you know, it's not that risky. This is not Oregon Trail situation. It's not the Oregon Trail. It's not the Donner Party. Come on. You're going to lose $9,000, but you're going to learn how to run something. And that risk that you take can be replaced very quickly. And that's what Monish brilliantly is talking about in his book, Dondo Investor. I know I sound like I'm pushing the book. Okay, I am pushing the book. It's one of the best books I've ever read because it takes a totally different view of risk. And, and you really need to read it if you're broke. And you need to read it if you're 50 years old and you, you don't know how the heck you're ever gonna retire. 
uh, because you've tried to, you know, you've done the right thing by your kids and you got them into school, except now they got school loans. I mean, huge number of people are out there right now trying to figure this out. And this book can help you figure this out. So I help you figure out your risk level, help you figure out that this idea that of rule number one, rule number one, don't lose money. Manesh Pabrai, low risk bet, high return potential. That idea is what is at the root of huge fortunes. That's how you get rich. Yeah, the concept of risk being equivalent to how long will it take me to make this money in my normal life? That's very interesting. <laughs> oh, yeah. I haven't heard that before. Yeah, that's a, that, I mean, think about that. If you were investing the way they tell you to, the, the, the financial services industry is going to tell you to invest in that. Think about that. If you're, you know, you, keep, you stay in your regular job and you manage to save, you know, $3,000 a year and you're investing at 5% between bonds and the, and the and the stock market that that would be considered a reasonable rate of return they would they would be like well we can't promise you more than that you know that mm-hmm. would be it mm-hmm. okay i i don't have the math right in front of me but i bet you never get to retirement <laughs> you know i bet you never get there i'll bet you that inflation chews up a good you know two-thirds of that five percent over time and you end up basically just having the money you saved and you'll never live well in retirement and so you've got to have a different plan. And when I listen to, you know, financial advisors like Susie Orman or Dave Bach, or, and I love these guys. I know Susie really well, and I know David, and I know, I don't know Dave Ramsey, but he says basically the same basic advice. You're saving money, keep the belt tight. This is all really smart, absolutely true, very patellish, but maybe not quite as hardcore. And you're saving money. But then how do you convert that into wealth, real wealth, not just, you know, a few thousand bucks? And that's where the, they don't have that great an answer at that point. I mean, it's basically invest in indexes and mutual funds. And if you're in a hot part of the stock market, you might get 12% a year or something. But by and large, the average of the stock market over 140 years is, you know, way lower than that. It's actually about 5% on the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and then you get some dividends. So you can't really uh, effectively expect to get rich based on advice of just trying to save a lot of money unless you happen to be in a really good job, right? So yeah. getting rich requires something else. And that's what we're talking about on this podcast is what is that something else you can do that will allow you to get rich without taking horrible chances with your money down the road? And that's what Manesh is talking about with the, this family. is that a great story? It is. It's an amazing story. Yeah. And I think it's just such a, there's such a freedom in thinking, all right, how long would it take me to make this money back just by saving, just by keeping my job? And, you know, and maybe it's three years, maybe it's five years. So maybe it's 10 years. I don't know, like whatever it is for you, that's the right amount of time that you're willing to risk. It's like you're risking time almost instead of money. Yeah, you're risking time. Exactly. You're going to, If it fails, you're going to learn a lot during that failure process, and you'll probably do a lot better on the second one. Um, And you're going to exchange that education for a couple of years of working some job. Yeah. You know, some immigrant job, right? You're going to make a, I mean, this is back in 1960, so he's making $1.60 an hour. Now, you know, maybe you could go to work for McDonald's and make 12 an hour. Yeah, there's just, there's a sense of freedom in it. And I think, there's a freedom in it that I don't feel when I say don't lose money, which feels protective and small. And like, I'm sort of like hugging myself and going, don't lose money. Ah! <laughs> there's, there's some fear there in that statement. And in the, in the sense of uh, actually take the time, figure out how long it's going to take you to make this money back if you lose it. It's not the end of the world. And going forth from there. And I think maybe rule number two might have to be, and make sure you pick an investment that has a large upside. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. But I feel like that's missing from rule number one. Yeah, it is. It is indeed. And and of course it's implied. I suppose there, it is. It's I, I think it's implied. And and when you look at where Buffett's coming from when he says that is he's in the position of somebody with what, hundred and twenty billion dollars under management, I think, or maybe more. Um, and a personal fortune of 30 or 40 billion before he gave a huge chunk of it away. And, you know, this is a guy who understands the power of wealth uh, and preserving wealth and understands that if 
if he just went forward and did his best to make good investments in wonderful businesses that he would, thought he was buying on sale, if all he did was not lose money on any of them, some of them are going to turn out to be correct investments. So essentially what you're doing is you're getting a, a no downside betting, uh, betting program here. You're going to go into a casino. You're going to bet. There is and, always a downside. I'm well, uncomfortable with this no downside statement. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Sorry so to is the So is the SEC. I'm, yeah. I'm quite sure. Well, I mean, like, you know, things happen. Yeah. So. Okay, well, I'm, I'm just pausing and just saying, okay, but think about this for a second. Okay. If you were buying $10 bills for $5, then would you agree there's no downside there? Like, if I could sell you a $10 bill right now for $5. I can definitely come up with a scenario All right. where I'm, the value of a $10 bill gonna dips do, do below have, $5 do you have a current, five, current dollars. Do you have a $5 bill on you? I do not. Go find. Would you find one if I were to sell you this $10 bill right here <laughs> for $5? Would you... Would, would you? I would buy the $10 bill. Okay. How much risk are you taking? Zero. Zero. Okay. So, you know, there could be... A reason why I would sell this $10 bill to you for $5, even while I know it's worth more than $5. I might just hate it. <laughs> just, there's just something about this $10 bill I don't like, right? Or whatever, right? If there, these events that occur in the real world that make an emotional uh make Mr. Market feel very depressed about a certain company or a certain industry, give us an opportunity to buy these things at a big discount. And if you understand the business, I mean, think about it. If you really understand the business and and this thing is on sale and it, if the business, let me, let me, it's so hard to go beyond Charlie here because they've really dialed, boiled it down. Mm -hmm. If you really understand the business and the business it has intrinsic characteristics that make it protected from competition in some way or another. And it's run by good people. And it's worth $10 and you can buy it for five. Where's the risk? That, that's, that's ultimately the question. Why wouldn't you be very certain you're going to make money on that? You would be. I think you would be, to put a number on it, 98% certain. <laughs> you won't give me 100 on this. I won't. I and, won't. And neither would any SEC regulator either. They wouldn't give me 100 on this. And fair enough, okay? Yeah, I mean, there's there's events that happen that affect companies in ways that are unpredictable. Yeah. Or that maybe are slightly predictable. Yeah. But very unlikely. Right. And that's just a fact. Okay. And that's true. So and, I think, and, and I think and that's why. And the bigger why, you are, the tougher it is to escape that that issue. Of course, yeah, if you're point. small, you can exit. Good point. Pretty quickly. So, all right, I'll give you the ninety-eight. And maybe you have maybe our version of diversification is having five companies instead of one. Oh yeah, there we go. I was just gonna say, you know, we we, you know, I don't like to get more than about than forty percent into one any one company, you know, just because maybe that little two percent niggling so thing is go. out there. There you go. So there you go. <laughs> I mean, fair enough. There, things can happen in the world. But I'm very comfortable that my best idea should get most of my, a big chunk of money, not most, but a big chunk. And then the next best idea, another chunk. And the next best idea, another chunk. And the trouble is, I just don't have 100 best ideas. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't know what these guys are thinking about when they're buying 100 things. But if I could get, in this market, if I could have five really good ideas, I would be all in on those five ideas. I can't find you know, it's really hard to find a good idea in this market. How many companies is your fund currently invested in? At all? Right you now. You mean like today, any money in them? Today, any money in them. Like six. Mm -hmm. they have so there's any six money in really there. good ideas? No. There's six really good ideas that are either no longer on sale or I'm not confident they're that good of an idea and I put a little in to spur myself on. Oh, there's small little... Mm -hmm temporary-ish investments? I've got a couple that are sizable, that I really, they're really good ideas. And it's so tempting in this market to load up on just those. But again, that little niggling thing, you know, mm -hmm. that what if. Mm -hmm. Like one of the companies is, a, is building a plant um, that does zinc production. And um, 
I, I don't see, I mean, it's possible that they just don't finish the plant, I guess. In the real world, that is, it's not an, an, an impossible event. If that happened, it wasn't a violation of some law of nature. So I've got to look at it and said, well, the chances of them not finish the plant are very, very remote. Um, and if they finish it, then it's going to be worth twice what it's worth today. So it's a really good bet. It's got, and if they don't finish it, what will happen? Well, right now, the plant's producing almost at the level of the old plant they shut down, and the stock was priced, you know, not that far down from where I was buying it. Sounds pretty good. It was pretty good. I like that one. But you can see, the tem even though the temptation is there to just go put in all the fund into that thing, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. I'm going to wait patiently yeah. because I know some other thing is coming along. They always do. The most difficult period of time for guys like me is times like this when there's just, it's very hard to find really good deals on companies I really understand and have a huge moat and are run by great people. You know, in a market like this, they're, they're, people are paying full price for that kind of stuff. So the don't lose money attitude in a situation like this is what? Is Stay to, in cash? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing a lot of reading. You know, just continuing to expand what I know, dig my canyon deeper. All that is all sort of a lifetime habit. You know, I read a lot. And that, uh, that just goes on. But I'm also, you know, I'm, I'm playing polo. <laughs> you know and you know we're teaching people how to invest i mean i'm doing podcasts it's like right here we are right because i've got some time i can do this right now right and it really you know the nature of this kind of investing is i always have time it's it's been that way for 30 years so it's it's really fun to know that you know you don't have to dance to the tune of a of a nine to five job doing what I do by any means. And those of you guys who are listening out there that are thinking maybe wow it might be fun to get good at this. One of the things that happens when you do get good at this is that you have a whole career field open up for yourself, just like it did for Monesh Pabrai and for me. And that is that wow if you start to get a track record together of doing even fifteen percent a year rate of return with real money. It doesn't have to be a lot of real money. It can be just a few thousand dollars and money will find you. People will come looking for you. Well, it sounds like, you know, in a time like this where maybe there aren't so many available companies on sale, you're not doing anything per year. You're doing zero per year. You're not losing money. But you're doing 0% a year. We're doing slightly better so than zero. Takes... <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I, my point is, does it take you know, let's say three to five years to build up a track record because we have to wait for these windows where there are companies available on sale. Yes and no. Um, we, can, we can build a track record when there's nothing much on sale by using um, more more trading strategies. Oh, that's right. You do all that stuff. I do do that stuff. <laughs> that's how I feel about it. It's and, all that and, stuff. And, I mean... Our, our basic strategies are tracked by um, American Association of Ind Individual Investors that track like 60 different groups, you know, or strategies like this. And they're tracking a rule one strategy that did 50% last year um, mm. and was the number one strategy in America for 2014. So that's the solution. Options. So that's, yeah, it's a okay. little, little different than. So, and that's what Buffett did too, is like he basically did merger and acquisition arbitrage to fill in the gaps of times like this. And, you know, they're not going to fill them in completely. We're not doing, you know, huge on it. But the amount of money that we have invested in that is doing huge. I mean, it's doing like, you know, last year was 56%. Wow. So, yeah. It was, good job. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> was, that was a good year. Um, and over time, you know, it's going to be less than that, surely. You know, it's not, that was a huge year. Mm -hmm. But um, that fills in the gaps pretty good. At least to basically make us feel comfortable about doing this with our money as opposed to putting it in a 30-year T-bill. So if we can do at or around, um, you know, what a 10-year T-bill is doing or a 30-year T-bill and have a lot of cash available to jump on the next time there's a great opportunity, you know, that's, that's a very workable strategy. And you can sit in cash for a couple of years and do nothing at all and still hit 26% per year compounded rates of return. Um, 
you know, at least theoretically you can by just having the real, the run-ups that occur after a big meltdown. I mean, think about this. In, nine, in 2009, when I said we were getting back in the market, Chipotle Grill was at 49 bucks. It went to 600 wow. in five years. So that's 50 to 100 is one double, to 200 is two doubles, to 400 is three doubles, and another half. So that's three and a half doubles in five years or six years. So the compounded return on that is probably in the ballpark of 60% per year. So you could sit in cash for a long time and then get five years with 60% a year and your overall 10-year return would be 26, mm -hmm. even though you're in cash for two or three years. It's just a longer time horizon. Yeah, a longer time horizon. And this, of course, this notion that you're going to sit in cash, this is, of course, that's not really possible for almost anybody that you're giving your money to. They can't just sit in cash. And we should really talk a, about that. A manager, that. a fund manager. Yeah. You want to talk about that next time? Uh, about what the fund, why the fund managers can't do this if this works this good? Why aren't they doing it? Sure. Yeah. Let's, let's dive into that a little bit. I don't think we're done with the whole Manesh Bride thing. but My guess is that they aren't doing it because people will pull their money out, which is what we already talked about. Oh, yeah, we did, didn't we? <laughs> People will pull their money out. That's exactly right. We did talk about it and move on. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> I wasn't trying that's to take the, that topic away from you. That's why the puzzled look on your face. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. What, where should we go with this next? That's that's what I, I'm thinking. Where, you know, for somebody like me who does not invest and um, is trying to figure this crazy world out, um, my questions are, what are the initial first steps? You know, super, to somebody who's an expert, this would be super basic. How do you even like begin? You know, I mentioned to a friend that there's this thing called paper trading where you practice your trades without actually putting any money in. And she's really into baseball. And she said, oh, like fantasy baseball. It's like fantasy trading. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, that's such a better name. <laughs> Paper trading doesn't explain it at all. But fantasy trading, that sounds a lot better. So there's, I think you can do that, right? Like you can start out by fantasy trading. Yeah. And seeing how you go. And seeing how you go. And that would be good if we were trading. Um, and we can teach you to trade. What does that mean? Well, we're not tra trading? No, we're investing. And the difference is really dramatic. In trading, you can see the results of strategies in a matter of days and weeks. Investing done right can mean that you buy a company and you buy it for $10. And, okay, well, I use the and wrong you, word. And then it's at $8 <laughs> a year later. You have to train me on these things. And you're looking okay, at your fine. paper trading and going, Fantasy Phil investing. Town's a moron. He's an idiot. I'm... My paper trading has gone on for three years here, and I've only made 12 cents. So we, we, we want to... I promise you, people will still say that. I know. So you know what I wanted to do is create a game. This would be way cool. Where I use real data, and you make long-term investments using these strategies. And the game is like, um, like a computer bridge game. It just spins it out fast. You can just really quickly see what the result was. And and then you can continue making these investments over time. Um, Are you talking about using historical numbers? Yeah, using historical oh, numbers. So without, if let's say, if I have no idea what happened to Google. Yeah, last... everything is ABC Corp. Right. Now the the problem, of course, is if I tell you anything about this company, you're gonna guess. You're gonna guess. But you could do it with less well known companies. That's actually a really good idea. I like That's that a idea. good idea. I could do it with less well known companies. But I like the idea of, of using the historical numbers. It's like a check on your math problem. Yeah. Like you do the math problem, then you flip to the back to find out the answer. Yeah, yeah. And, see and this would tell you if you were getting it right. Yeah. Because the whole idea is that you're investing with rule number one, don't lose money. Or as Prabhai says, you know, you know, very little loss p potential and a huge upside. And you should be able to see it over a five to ten year period mm -hmm. that the results are in. Mm -hmm. um, and nobody has that. We should build that. That'd be interesting to do here talking about it we could talk about a couple different companies call them abc company okay and see what people think okay that's a great idea okay let's do that um so we could test me out okay. i promise you lots of wrong answers okay then let's see if we can play around with that in the next podcast all right 
Would you? Just as a, I don't know if it's going to happen on the next one. We're going to have to prepare. Oh, that's true. Okay, well. Yeah, but we'll get to we'll it. Di- we'll dive into that in a little while. Yeah. But next time, let's and talk about how you... And by preparing, I, of course, mean you preparing. <laughs> because... Because <laughs> you have to go actually back and do you your law practice. Test. Is that what you mean? You have <laughs> to go back you. to work. <laughs> so um, let's do that. And... Um, uh, and let's get that rolling. And then let's, next time, let's take on this very challenging question of how do you start? Yeah. How do you begin? I think that would be hugely valuable. I know to me. I hope it's valuable to other people, but mostly I care about me. All right. Good. What do I need? <laughs> Until then, time to go play. All right. Bye. See you. Thanks for listening to Invested, the Rule One podcast. If you like us, please subscribe and leave a review for us on iTunes. You can get our notes and links for this podcast and post comments about this show and get more information about how to invest on your own by going to ruleonepodcast.com. Everything we've discussed in this podcast is either Danielle's opinion or my opinion and is not to be taken as investment advice because I am not your investment advisor nor have I considered your personal situation as your fiduciary. This podcast is for your entertainment and education only, and I hope you've enjoyed it. So until next week, it's time to go play. See ya.